Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that will remind you that this show is even more enjoyable after you hit that subscribe or follow button. Here is the captain. And it gets even better when you hit the stop button. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very excited to be featuring Big Sky Daddy by the wonderful folks over at Holy Trinity Brewing Company in beautiful Columbus, Ohio. There's a new IPA in town with a new style that is all its own. For this IPA is not West Coast or hazy, no. Check out Big Sky Daddy. It's a cold IPA that stars six amazing hop varieties. You are going to love it. ABV 7.5% garage grade, four and a half bottle caps out of five. And here's a cheers to our good friends that helped us out with this week's shows. First up, a big shout out to Melody in Riverside, California. And a big shout out to Awesome Amanda in Columbia, Kentucky. Next, here's a cheers to Megan in Greenville, South Carolina. And last but certainly not least, we are sending a big Ron Swanson please and thank you to Victoria in Denver, Colorado. Thanks to everyone for helping us out with this week's beer fund. If you want to help us out with next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. Yeah, B-W-E-R-R-U-N, beer run. Get you some. Make sure you go to our website, truecrimegarage.com and sign up on our mailing list. And if you got some time, leave us a five-star review on iTunes. And Colonel, that's enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. The village of Paulding is a warm and welcoming community of almost 3,600 residents. It is also the county seat of Paulding County, Ohio. At the heart of the village, you will find the historic county courthouse in the center of a lush green lawn, complete with an old-fashioned gazebo. The courthouse is surrounded by a traditional town square with quaint shops and family-owned restaurants. Paulding is a quintessential slice of Americana that has managed to preserve its authentic charm. On a Sunday night in 1960, 14-year-old Nancy Eagleson was walking near that town square. The county sheriff's office is nearby. The city's small police station nearby as well. But sadly, As it would turn out, that did not matter. Because on that night, in Tiny Town, USA, there was a predator waiting in the shadows. Nancy was pulled into a car that evening as she walked home from a movie with her five-year-old sister, Cheryl. The younger girl screamed and ran to a neighbor's home, telling him her sister had been grabbed by a man wearing glasses. About seven hours after the abduction, Two raccoon hunters found Nancy's body in a wooded area near Paulding. Authorities found little evidence at the scene. They were left with little else other than the words of a five-year-old. Armed with the description, the Sheriff's Department and Paulding Police began a canvas of the village's then 2,300 residents seeking information. Paulding County Sheriff John Keeler said the only apparent motive was a sexual attack. Early in the investigation, he said he had uncovered several clues. Keeler said they were compiling a list of possible suspects. Those persons will be interviewed. And at the start of the investigation, he said the suspect list was composed mostly of names of persons convicted of other crimes in the sparsely populated Paulding area. The murder was the first in the village of Paulding in six years. 
While lawmen continued their around-the-clock investigation, the residents of Paulding were badly frightened by the abduction and murder of the high school freshman and held divided opinions concerning the killer. Some persons believed the crime was committed by a local man, while others wondered if the crime was committed by a crazed man traveling through the area. Nancy Eagleson was born and raised in Paulding. Services were held in the First Church of Christ, where she regularly attended. The murder case is now 62 years old, and it remains unsolved for now. Today, the sheriff of Paulding County is Jason Landers, and he told me this is the most emotional and heartbreaking case in our county's history. This is True Crime Garage. This week, we will be talking about an Ohio cold case that is heating up once again. Up until May of this year, I had never heard of this case before. And while it was a case I never knew, yet it is a case that so many refuse to forget. That is the shocking and horrifying murder of 14-year-old Nancy Eagleson. The crime that forever changed the village of Paulding, Ohio. Now, going back to 1960... The village of Paulding then had about 2,300 residents, but the population for the entire county of Paulding was less than 17,000 people. Paulding is in the northwest of Ohio. The county line to the west is also the state line into Indiana. And then from roughly the center of Paulding Village, if you drive one hour going north, you are in Michigan. So because of the location of the village and because of the county's close proximity to state lines, our true crime mystery will take us into some other states. Earlier this year, the captain and I were in Vegas. This was the last weekend of April for the 2022 CrimeCon event. Hey, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. And so the way that we found out about this case was at CrimeCon. There is a relatively new website called Uncovered. Uncovered is working to put together the most comprehensive website database of cold cases and missing persons from all over the country. Now, this is quite the undertaking because experts estimate that based on information from the Uniform Crime Reporting Program from our friends at the FBI, data shows that in our country, the greatest of nations, we currently have approximately 250,000 unsolved murders, a number that increases by about 6,000 each year. So Nancy's case is just one of many, many thousands. But we say cold case here, and this case is heating up quite a bit. And we may just finally be able to get some answers for Nancy's family, primarily her sisters, Meryl and Cheryl. Remember back to today's trailer, Cheryl was with Nancy, the night that she was abducted. But back to Uncovered.com, one of the architects behind the Uncovered website is from Paulding, and she approached the Porchlight Project and True Crime Garage at CrimeCon and said, hey, have you ever heard of this case? So that's how we got to where we are today, Captain. Eyeballs deep in this case that I think has some meat on the bone. This case can still be solved. For those who don't know what the Project Porchlight is, can you explain it to them? So the Porchlight Project is a organization that True Crime Garage has been tied to and involved with for several years now. And the Porchlight Project offers victim advocacy to family members of victims of cold cases. And some of the services that they can offer to victims into their families is DNA testing in cold cases, ground searches for somebody that may be still missing or offering trained canines and a team of volunteers to assist with ground searches, and also renewed media attention to a case. So when a case goes cold, it also goes cold in the media. And it's good to remind everybody that this case still exists. It's still unsolved. And these people still need your help, the public's help, and they need law enforcement's help. So 
at Porchlight. They are there to assist the victims, victims' families, and law enforcement with cold cases specific to the state of Ohio. And if anybody wishes to make a donation or if you are a person who is personally connected to an Ohio cold case and you would like to submit a case, you can go to porchlightonline.org to learn more. And we've been able to cover some of the cases that you guys have worked on, which then drums up interest. It drums up people talking about the case and possibly some leads as well. So let's dive into this case. Let's dive into the timeline of Nancy Eagleson. Nancy Eagleson was kidnapped and murdered in rural Paulding Village, Ohio in 1960. Her five-year-old sister Cheryl was the only witness to this now 62-year-old cold case. The date was Sunday, November 13th, 1960. The day began as a typical Sunday for 14-year-old Nancy and the Eagleson family. Nancy attended church and then had a meal with her family afterward. Nancy and her five-year-old sister, Cheryl, went to a local movie theater, which is a few blocks away from their home. So all of the general reporting, Captain, on this case says just blocks away, which is absolutely true. But to give a little more perspective, it's approximately a half of a mile from the Eagleson home to the theater. And according to my little map app, it is about a 10 to 12 minute walk, but probably a little slower with a five-year-old walking with you. Nancy and Cheryl were there to see a double feature at the theater. So they are there at the theater for a considerable amount of time. But shortly after the movies, the two had just left the double feature. Nancy and Cheryl decided to get sodas from a local restaurant before they started their walk home. At the local restaurant, the girls talked to some friends and some other people from Paulding. Now it's about 7 p.m. and it's starting to get dark. And this is when they began their walk from the restaurant. Nearby is Paulding Bowling Alley. Nancy and Cheryl's father, Donald Eagleson, was working at the bowling alley that night. Now, from my understanding, Captain, This is more of a second job, and Donald works for a more traditional 9-to-5 type job elsewhere during the week. Right. So the girls stop by to talk to their dad. Now, even though they don't have very far to walk, Nancy thought that they would stop by. This is because Nancy was wearing new shoes with a heel, and as the story goes, they stopped by their father's work to see if he would drive them home. There's a couple of problems. You know, this story's a little more complicated than just, oh, my, my feet might be hurting from these new shoes. Would you drive us home? Donald is still working at the time. Right. He's still on the clock, so he's not able to give them a ride home from the bowling alley. But part of the story that gets lost along the way is not that dad told him no. It was more of a situation of, yeah, if you could just wait 40 minutes or 30 minutes until the end of my shift... I'll drive you guys home with me. I'm leaving anyway. The girls didn't want to wait. They're little kids. Kids hate waiting. So they didn't want to wait. And so they turned down the ride. They don't want to wait. So from the bowling alley out into the dark and down the road, they go. Again, we have Nancy. She's 14. We have Cheryl. She's five. They're leaving the bowling alley. They're going to head east on East Jackson Street. They're going to go past the old iron bridge. This is really a pretty quick walk from the center of town. So they are walking eastwardly on East Jackson Street. And from my understanding, back in 1960, there was an old, not still in operation gas station called Pelock that was located on the corner of East Jackson Street and Flat Rock Drive. So there would have been a driveway and a little lot right there on the corner of these two streets. Well, the girls need to go on Flat Rock Drive. They live on Flat Rock Drive. So naturally, with there being a driveway and a parking lot there right there on the corner, they're going to kind of cut through and cut the corner a little bit of these two streets. So the girls are cutting through, and they are walking the driveway of the old Pelock station. Now, the girls 
as said, live on Flat Rock Drive. Once they get past the Pelock Station, they only have about six houses to go past Pelocks, and then they are home. Mm-hmm. There, there are houses that line both sides of this street. So if you are traveling north, as they were on foot, the girls live on the left-hand side of the street. Now, one of the details in this case that I think can be and is very important, the house where the girls live is on that Flat Rock Drive. At this point in our timeline, this is the street that the girls are walking on. This Flat Rock Drive is also State Route 111. Ohio State Route 111 runs between the Indiana State Line and Defiance, Ohio. Most of the route is a rural two-lane highway, and it passes through both farmland and residential properties. As the girls are cutting through Pelocks, they notice a car parked in the driveway there. According to statements later given by Cheryl, there was a man sitting in a car, in that car that was parked there. They walked past the car and past the lot on the corner, and they passed a small house on their left. They're getting closer to their home. This is when the girls noticed a car was following them. Now, to be perfectly clear here, it's never been reported that the car at p and the car following them is the same. Right. But to me, it it feels kind of right. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not terribly far from p when they, they get this feeling that a vehicle is following them. Cheryl said that the car following them really kind of spooked both of the girls because the car was kind of slowly idling behind, following behind them. So the car pulls up alongside of the girls. Some of the reporting out there states that the man driving the car asked for directions, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Because according to Cheryl, the man asked the girls if they wanted a ride, to which the older sister, Nancy, replied, no, thank you. We are almost there. Which is both true and incredibly sad because this is all going to go down really just a handful of houses away from the two girls being home. Well, and also as you get older, you have spider senses. And so you know when something doesn't feel right. You know when this person that just claims to be asking for directions, you know when there's something more dangerous about them. That's true. And think of this situation. It's dark out. We have two children walking together And look, cars don't follow pedestrians very often, especially ones that the pedestrians do not recognize. And then when the person pulls up alongside of you and you do not recognize them and they engage you in conversation, yeah, you're you're probably, probably very concerned at this point. And obviously Nancy's going to be thinking more about this than her five-year-old sister is going to be, but she's one, she's not strong enough to defend herself against uh, adult male, but she can't run because she has to protect her five-year-old sister. So after they turn down the offer of a ride with the strange man, this man stops his car and in a hurry, he gets out, runs over to Nancy and grabs her, forcing her into the car on a well-lit street in full view of seven homes. Cheryl tried to grab the man but he threw her down to the ground. Cheryl then ran screaming to the safety of a neighbor's house, only to see the car drive away with Nancy in the back seat. Do we know what time roughly this kidnapping took place? I think roughly is a good word to put it, because as the sheriff would later say, according to the sheriff, the abduction occurred at approximately 7.40 p.m. There is one little hiccup here, though, because there was a slight delay in reporting the abduction. And this was no one's fault, but the delay came because Cheryl ran to the closest neighbor's house. And again, it was 1960, so not everyone has a home phone back then. Yeah, just the fancy people. Nancy was abducted right in front of the home of Mr. and Mrs. Larson. So Cheryl ran to that home and she screamed at the homeowners. Now this is Mr. and Mrs. Larson, John Larson and Betty Larson. 
And these people are essentially neighbors of the Eaglesons, right? They're only several houses away from being home. They know the Larsons quite well. Well, also, like you said, it's 1960. So what's fascinating to me about this case is there's so many things that are different. Like today, in a case, you'd be looking for DNA, for example. They didn't really have that technology back then. And also, just like you said, some of these people in this neighborhood, they don't have phones. And I don't know that this is 100% the case, but I believe at the time on the street, a lot of those homes were being rented. And that might be why, you know, people weren't as grounded back then when you were renting and maybe you didn't bother to set up a home phone or it was too expensive. But also it's 1960. And so what was more commonplace, you'd know your neighbors. And if it was me and I needed to communicate, I'd simply open up a window and just start yelling. Like Rocky. <laughs> Hey, Paulie, it's me, Rocky. I'll call you later. So what they have to do here is Cheryl runs to the neighbors that she knows and trusts. And again, the abduction takes place nearly right in front of their home. And it's through tears. It's fighting through tears that she tells Mr. and Mrs. Larson what had happened and that a man took her sister, Nancy. Right. So the Larsons take Cheryl and they drive to the nearest phone and call the police. The village of Paulding does have a police department today and even back then, but there was maybe like three guys that worked there. Mm -hmm. And as we have seen in some of the cases, some of these older cases, it's probably just two dumb guys in a garage with funny outfits that we've covered here in the garage. Sometimes on a Sunday night, they will take emergency calls, but might not have anyone actively working or right. patrolling because it's sleepy town America. Nothing's really going on. There's no need for the law at those hours until there's an emergency. But also at the same time, and this is what's weird to me, if this were to have been a local person, the suspect, there's not a great law enforcement presence in this county because there's very few people that live in the entire county at the time. But out of all the places in the county, this seems like a very risky or more risky place to commit such a crime if you planned it out because you have the village of Paulding Police Department. You also have the county of Paulding Sheriff's Department that is housed right there in the little village. So at the same time, you got the police department and the sheriff's department is in Paulding as well in 1960. They have the sheriff, John Keeler. And he's got, I believe, two or three deputies of his own. So that is three or four at the sheriff's department for the entire county. I'm not sure which of the two agencies was called, but both sprung into action as soon as the call went out. So the law is now out and rushing around. They're looking for Nancy. They're looking for the dark colored car that was described by her little sister, Cheryl. And they're looking for the man that took Nancy. And of course, really looking for anyone who may have seen Nancy or knows anything at all. Cheers to everybody. Cheers to you, Colonel. Cheers to you, Captain. Tall cans in the air to all the good listeners out there. Mm -hmm. Just a quick reminder before we jump back into this week's case. If you are listening to this on Tuesday, August 23rd, when this episode drops, unfortunately today marks 30 years since Tammy Zawicki was abducted and killed. We covered her case and several others in the America's Highway Serial Killers episodes. We did four parts on that story. 
That is episodes 590 through 593 released in June of this year. If you haven't listened to those yet, give it a listen, please. We're now at 30 years on Tammy Zawicki's cold case. So 14-year-old Nancy was walking with her sister, 5-year-old Cheryl. They get almost back to their house. They were followed by a car. This person asks for directions and then jumps out of the car, kidnaps Nancy. Cheryl runs to a neighbor's house. They then make a call to law enforcement. Law enforcement is now out looking for this kidnapper. Yeah, and this is one of those cases where, you know, we find these little tidbits of sad information in some of these cases that we cover. And Nancy's case is just really full of them, unfortunately, because think about this situation. And now all of the cases that we cover are unfortunate. They're all sad. They're all heartbreaking cases, just like Tammy Zawicki's that we just mentioned coming back from the break. But in Nancy's case, there are very few cases that I can think of that we've covered that there was a, a sibling, a, a, a tiny child walking with the person who gets abducted. Right. And mind you, just minutes before the abduction takes place, their father was presented with a possible opportunity to drive his children home. And he says, Hey, I got to finish out my shift. And the girls say, well, we don't feel like we don't feel much like waiting. And so they went on, they went on ahead. And then mom is at home just about four or five houses away from where they are abducted. They're abducted on a well-lit street in front of the view of six or seven other homes. Like you said, in so many cases, there's these, what if this would have happened moment? What if this would have happened? And those people sometimes get trapped in those what ifs for the rest of their lives. And can you imagine the heartache and the guilt felt by Nancy's family, but especially her little sister, Cheryl, who was there that night when it went down and what we will later see, and we'll continue to go through the timeline here, captain. But one thing that we're going to see in this case that is incredibly sad and unfortunate for the investigation as well is that Cheryl is so little. She's such a young child at the time. And this all happened so very quickly that she's able to provide some details to law enforcement, but not a whole lot of details that are going to help them when it comes to trying to find the person who did this. The other thing that's incredibly shocking in this case, and it's something that we don't see very often in cases that we've covered, but the search for Nancy or the vehicle that took her, it's not a very lengthy one. You know, sometimes it can be days or weeks or unfortunately months or even longer before our victim is found. Now, we're not happy about the result, obviously, here, but the frantic search for Nancy ended when not more than seven hours later, two raccoon hunters, this is Joseph Offrens and Kenneth Nelson, they find Nancy's body. Her body was located in a clearing in a heavily wooded area. She was lying about 100 feet from the road. She was partially clothed with some of her clothing lying nearby. At first, the two hunters thought that what they were seeing was a discarded Halloween costume. Keep in mind, this is early November, so Halloween costume makes a little bit of sense. Right. They get closer, and it... It is not anything that anybody would want to find. It's not a mannequin. The road that we are talking about, and this goes back to something that I think might be key here in this case, especially when we get to the suspect portion of it. This was Paulding County Road 176. So I'm going to have to try to explain this visual to all of the listeners out there, Captain, and you know how great I am at doing this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Some say you're the Van Gogh of painting pictures with words. Right. I would recommend that you pull up the village of Paulding on your favorite map app that you use and look this up, but it will make a lot of sense, but it will also. And I recommend for the listeners to cut their ears off like, like Van Gogh before, before we get to the painting of the picture. It will also present several questions to the listeners as well. So Paulding County Road 176, 
is where the body's found, about 100 feet from the road. Flat Rock Drive, as we explained, is the road that Nancy and Cheryl live on with their family. And Flat Rock Road is also State Route 111. Now, where the abduction takes place is on the left-hand side of the road if you are traveling north on Flat Rock Drive slash State Route 111. The suspect's car, after putting Nancy into the back seat, then drives and continues north on Flat Rock Road. It's pretty much a straight shot after you go around one curve there. But once you get going, you're going to come to a stop sign. And I don't know if there was even a stop sign back then. There is one there now. And once you get to that stop sign, you make a left to continue on State Route 111. If you don't make a left at that stop sign, you just go straight and that road becomes Paulding County Road 176. So while the road has a different name, when you look at it on a map, it essentially looks like the same road. Right. Nancy's basically abducted, thrown into this car. The driver speeds off, but he never really goes anywhere as far as we know. Right. We have seven hours that expire between the time of the abduction, roughly seven hours between the time of the abduction and when her body is found. But if you go from point A to point B, we're pretty much talking about the same road. Yeah, but that makes me wonder because we do have that seven hour time gap. Did this person live close or know of a secluded area that he took her to first and then dumped her body? basically in the same area. The Paulding County Sheriff, John Keeler, who was going to oversee this investigation. This was, this was really probably too big of a case, too complicated of a case for the sheriff's department, but it was certainly most certainly too big and complicated of a case for the little village police department. So the County Sheriff is going to oversee this case. And I really think uh, there's some debate on, how good of a job he did per the resident's perspective. And we'll get into that as we continue along. But immediately, one thing that he did do, and this is where I give praise to John Keeler, is he immediately called in the Ohio State Patrol to come in and assist in this investigation, assist in some type of manhunt for whoever took her. That didn't happen a lot back in 1960. Sheriff's Department's, Chief of police back then, they didn't call in other agencies so quickly here. He does that. And this is from a statement from the daily advocate newspaper out of Greenville. And it says Nancy's death was the first murder of this type in this Northwestern Ohio community of 2,300. Most of the local authorities have never investigated a murder. I wanted to make sure that we included that statement from the daily advocate because My suspicions right away when learning about this case was just that. I had wondered if any of these guys had ever investigated a murder before, and that statement that we just read was from a paper, a local paper, local to Northwest Ohio anyway, and that statement made at the time of the murder. Now, unfortunately, mistakes and errors will occur in a homicide investigation and homicide investigations, but you may end up with even more errors due to the lack of experience. Right, but just because you've never worked a case before doesn't mean you're incapable of solving one. But like you said, you're probably more capable of making more mistakes. The other thing, too, and thank you for pointing that out, Captain, for this lack of experience, you cannot blame law enforcement. It's not their fault that they live in a nice area where the most violent of crimes is not being committed. Also, the lack of crime in the area can bolster the idea that law enforcement in the area are, in fact, doing a great job. But also, some of the techniques that you use to solve a crime that's not a murder, you can use to solve a murder case. One of the very first errors that I see in this investigation comes from the crime scene. Our longtime listeners know that when we are talking about an abduction murder case, We are talking about multiple crime scenes. First, in this situation, we have the scene of the abduction. 
almost right in front of the Larson's home. Second, we have the perpetrator's vehicle. This is one of the tools used by the killer to take Nancy away and take her to the next location, which likely is our third and final crime scene. This is the location where Nancy's body was found. And we will circle back around and talk about the possibility of a fourth crime scene. But before we do, because we are talking about mistakes made in the investigation, the first one I see is they should have had some tire tracks. I would have thought that you could find tire tracks at the abduction scene, crime scene number one. Right. And I definitely, definitely think you would have found tire tracks from the suspect's car where Nancy's body was found. Very possible, but you also have to take into account that she was only 14 years old, so she's not going to weigh a lot. I bet she was under 90 pounds. So you can carry the victim pretty easily. But yeah, tire tracks, maybe even footprints. And that's the thing, Captain. You're exactly right. Nancy Eagleson was listed at 85 pounds approximately at the time of her death. So... Yes, it wouldn't have been terribly difficult to carry her the 100 feet from the roadside and place the body there. There's also a chance that she was alive before getting to where she's eventually found. The thing, though, that makes it difficult for me to look at this situation and go, man, we missed out on something potentially big here for our investigation is let's go back to crime scene number one, where the abduction took place. It is possible, and based off of the recollection of the five-year-old, Cheryl, our witness, it's not clear if the driver and their vehicle stopped off of the road or not. They may have still completely been on the road or been on gravel. There's Seeing the location as it is today, it's not clear that the driver would have had to pull into the dirt or the mud or the grass. Right. Now, when we go out to crime scene number three, where Nancy's body is later located, you know, we say Paulding County road 176. I would be shocked. You know, I'm a betting man, captain. I would wager a $50 bill right now that that road was probably not a paved road back in 1960. Big spin. It was probably gravel would be my guess. Probably. And 100 feet from the road, it would make sense to me if the killer and the abductor took her immediately from point A to point B, from abduction scene to where she was eventually found. Right. I think that the killer would have had to pull off of the road because of the way that it's situated. Law enforcement, keep in mind, shortly after. By 8 p.m. at the latest, they're hopping in their cars and they're driving out looking for, one, the car that took Nancy, two, Nancy standing on the side of the road somewhere because the captor abductor let her go. Those are the two main things that you're looking for. If you drove out to the abduction scene and you know which direction the vehicle went, you're going to continue naturally going down that road. It's a straight shot once you get past those curves to where a vehicle would have been parked had it remained on the road to carry her to where she's later seen. The story ends completely different if they spot that car shortly after the abduction. Well, where we're going, there are no roads. And it's not super late, so there's still people out and about doing things. So there's a possibility that we would have had an eyewitness of that vehicle being parked for a time period. There was a tree stump that was in the general area of where Nancy's body was located. And one of the old statements from the investigation and from that crime scene was that there was some kind of paint on that tree stump. Now, nobody can say for certain, but there's a thought that in the dark that the abductor did not see that tree stump and may have brushed up against it with the car, leaving a paint mark on the tree stump or even ran over that tree stump. Well, that'd be a great 
piece of evidence to test. Right, exactly. And the thing is, we've discussed this a hundred times here in the garage. Maybe a billion. Police love looking for a vehicle. Yes. Police are very good at finding vehicles. Mm -hmm. And had they had tire tracks, there's a good chance that they would have known what kind of vehicle to hone in on. But they didn't have that. And I think that was a misstep here in this investigation. Now, November in Ohio means lots of leaves on the ground. Yeah, hoodie weather, pumpkin spice lattes. And then where Nancy was found, all kinds of people were coming in trying to help. We're talking about this is the state police. Family members were on the scene. The newspapers, the hunters that were there. So where she was found was not secured by police. They didn't know better. And so the crime scene was not going to be incredibly helpful in a case where you already have very little to work with from the very beginning. Unfortunately, this was a murder that happened. I believe everything went down rather quickly, and in the process, the killer left few clues behind. It's a complicated case, a complicated investigation, and when you fail to locate and document the suspect's car's tire tracks... Left behind, you severely compromised your investigation. Well, I hate to keep bringing it up, but your other eyewitness is five years old. So you have to be very careful when you're questioning a young person because you don't want to be so suggestive that they just start telling you information that's not actually true, but just things that they might think you want to hear. And I want to circle back to something that you had mentioned earlier, Captain, which I think is something very interesting to contemplate here in this case. Could there have been a possible fourth crime scene? We talked about the abduction site. The abductor's vehicle is crime scene number two. And then we are calling the location of her body where her body is found. That is our final crime scene. But could there be a situation where the abductor took Nancy somewhere before taking her to that final site? I think it's likely it's, it's a possibility, and it could explain why they didn't see a car on that county road, that what I believe to be an unpaved road out near where her body was later found. Right. So maybe maybe the suspect's car never goes off-road, never leaves any tire tracks in the dirt or the mud or up near her body, and that's why they didn't see a vehicle there. If they would have just gone right to that that. Again, today it's a, a four-way stop. I don't think they would have had a four-way stop back then. But if they would have gone up to that that part right there, that four-way stop, and it would be a natural place to go. You've been told that she was abducted and the, the attacker took her north, continued on State Route 111. You would go up there looking for that vehicle, and even if you only got to that four-way stop so that you could turn around and head back into town and look elsewhere, if the vehicle was sitting on the road, you would have spotted it. So there's a reason why they didn't spot that vehicle when they were out looking for Nancy. Either A, it wasn't there, and there is, in fact, the fourth crime scene, right. or B, he took the car and went off the road with it, so it would not be seen from that four-way stop. Yeah, and just imagine what the neighbors are going through. Imagine what her father is going through. I mean, you you want to find this individual, rip their throat out. You, you want to kill this individual. They just took your child from you. The other thing that's very complicated when we try to review this case here, Nancy Eagleson's case, is I do not have a great understanding of if she was killed in a vehicle, killed elsewhere, or killed where she was found. There's some debate about that. There are people out there that have followed this case from Jump Street that insist that she was probably killed, shot and killed in a vehicle. There are other people that believe she was killed near where she was found. And then you have the other argument, if in fact there was a fourth crime scene, an additional crime scene, she could have been killed at that location. And I don't know if they know this or if this was a misstep, but you would think that there would be some evidence at the crime scene to let us know if she was just dumped there or if it was actual crime scene. 
What would follow, Captain, would be an extensive search of every local vehicle that matched the description that was provided to law enforcement by our surviving eyewitness, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. This was a big undertaking. The other thing they did was multiple interviews with community members. And they say that that line community members, but this was everybody from prominent figures in the community, well-liked upstanding citizens to known criminals in the area as well. Later, Cheryl would even be put under hypnosis in hopes that she could recall details from the kidnapping that she had previously been unable to report to the authorities. The thing that happens very early on in this case, though, that is incredibly interesting is from a newspaper article that came out on November 15th, 1960. This is from a newspaper in the great state of Indiana. Well, keep in mind that she was kidnapped on the 13th and then her body was found a little bit later on the 14th. So this news is coming out pretty quickly. Very quickly. And the headline reads, Two Slayings Committed by Same Killer? Question mark. And this is a news story out of the great city of Chicago. And the article reads, Illinois authorities Monday checked an Ohio slaying in an attempt to ascertain whether the killer might also be the same man sought in the death of a nine-year-old Chicago girl. And it goes on to say, Captain James McMahon, chief of detectives, said several similarities were noted between the slayings of Gloria Kowalowicz, age nine, in Chicago, and Nancy Eagleson, age 14, of Paulding, Ohio. Have we got a killer traveling cross-country? McMahon wondered aloud before reporters. Thank you so much for joining us here in the garage. Make sure you come back tomorrow. We got so much more to get to in this case. And until then, be good, be kind, and don't live.